Hello. What have we got here? Tanglewood. A tanglewood something or other. And it's interesting because we don't have yet a name for it. And interestingly, on the thing on the inside, Tanglewood Guitar Company, model number nothing, made in Korea. looking thing. Um, this this top looks a lot like a veneer. I mean looks like it actually looks like a photographic veneer but I don't know enough about that to to really know but it's uh, yeah it, has, it just has that slight look about it. Um, we have a, a very slight lifting of the bridge going on over there, and um, it's a very, very minor thing. Um, I just get a bit of this here tape, for example. <coughs> um, yeah, you can see this. There's a fair bit of uh, a bit of pull going on, but <coughs> it may not be. It's it's not the end of the world. Um, also, what there is in, with that guitar, as with so many, sorry, Morris, is we can detect some quite considerable um, bellying. Actually, um, it's not a very good angle for you to see it, but if you were to look down there like this. You can see that's how much bellying there is in the top. The top is ideally meant to be flat, closer to what it is there, um, but directly behind the bridge you can see that we've got quite considerable lifting <coughs> or rising up. And that is, as far as I've ever been able to determine, it's a combination of two things. The hum humongous pulling of the pulling up of the strings, constantly pulling this part of the bridge, and particularly in, in this case, um, because of the anchor at the back here, so it's pulling constantly pulling this part of the bridge forward, pivoting around this edge. So it's, um, but also due to humidity, this expands, and because the wood's got nowhere to go, it, it expands in a kind of um, concave shape. And the result is you get a lifting action, which this has. It, the action gets higher, um, and you get progressive lifting off the bridge and eventually the bridge will come off altogether. Um, it's actually quite nice to play as is. It's got a really nice first fret action. And there's a little uh, thing, a little bit of hint here, there's some black marker pen on these frets here where somebody's done some fret leveling. <coughs> hey Morris, check him out. Now you're going to give up that bit of climbing. Uh, it's <coughs> it's quite a nice feel to it. It's got a nice neck on it, which is very similar to the neck I've put on my Eki Telecaster thing. Um, although the headstock on mine's a little bit bigger, but they're basically the same kind of neck, uh, and mine's 24 frets. But it's got a really nice um, amplified tone. It's got a kind of square section, or roughly, a little slight, slight little concave convexity. You know. It's not a bowl back exactly, but it's nice. Um, but the, the worry, the longer term worry, has got to be this. And actually, if I press on it, there is very little that I can do to um, press it down. Uh, the thing about this, <coughs> we 
when you have lifting bridge and the bellying top, which you saw with the ruler, the solution to this has to be to dehumidify it progressively over time. And what will happen is if I set a nice action or a slightly nicer action on this now, make sure the frets will all work with that action, um, and Malcolm um, dehumidifies this top and it flattens out, what will happen is the action will go below what he wants and we'll have to either shim that or replace the saddle. But that isn't a problem, you know, that's easy enough to do. Um, if you're lucky enough that your dehumidification has a positive effect, um, then, you know, it's a small price to pay. Um, also, dehumidifying this will bring this back flat to the surface, but what it won't do is obviously re-glue it. Um, the problem with re-gluing it now is, funnily enough, it would actually prevent the bridge from sitting flush with the top if dehumidification is successful. Um, because there would be a kind of, well, yeah, there'd be a, pl a, a padding of dry glue under there, and because um, we aren't, with, there's no way we've got any <coughs> space to put a lot of force on this to try and glue it to this curve. So <coughs> I would leave that for a future time, um, and what my plan would be on this would be to um, just lower this just a tiny little bit, and, and in doing so, then make sure the nut slots are right. Uh, these strings are a, da a bit damaged. Uh, Malcolm's got some replacements here which equally aren't uh, fantastic. But and and in fact, I think they're sort of. Uh, I think they would be quite budget. So I'm slightly reluctant to put those on. Um, but anyway, look. The point is that's that's got damage here. That's going to break at some point. That that G. Um, I think what I'm going to do is, for my pal, I'm going to get him a set of decent strings ordered in. I was going to have this. Let's see if I can get this playing ready for tomorrow. But I think I think it needs a it needs a better set of strings on there. I will put those other ones on. I guess what I'm saying that for is I'll use these as sacrificial strings for this purpose. Okay, so my quick measurement was just to see what we've got in the way of action. The first fret action is superb. Somebody's done a really good job on that, whether that's by accident or, or by design. Um, down here we've got two and a half mils at the last fret low E, and uh, two, two on the high E. <clears throat> so low E, 2.5, high E, 2.5. That's uh, right, two. Rub that out. Two point zero, two point five. Um, I always want to go two down to one point five. And um, this has got a shim in here, which it may not need to have in a minute once we decide on <coughs> what's going on here. Um, in terms of these frets, are quite low, so we'll see what's going, what gives. Almost no relief in the neck at all. Um, which will make it nice to play, but um, somebody's done something with these before. Anyway, point here is um, I'm gonna I'm gonna want to do two things. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slack off the strings, but I want to no I can't. I yes I can. I want to capo this uh, after I've slacked the strings off. Remember these are just sacrificial, so I'm gonna slack these off. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if these break because they have a, a look of one of them certainly, the G has been overstressed before. So I'm, I'm taking these down for a minute and then what I'll do is I'm going to take the neck off. <clears throat> I'm going to take that shim out, paper shim of some kind, um, and, and just try and uh, assess what it was there for. So I, I think a way of helping me do that, so these don't come flying off and get completely untangled off there. I'm going to just examine, check out this shim, um, and then 
uh, and what I'll do is put it back together again without the shim and then we'll, we'll remeasure uh, and hopefully adjust everything without that need for a shim because it's so thin and papery I don't really see there being given that we've got a high action at the moment I don't see a, a, a good reason for the shim or a, a reason for keeping it on there so I'm just going to take this apart for a minute this guitar is in very good neck apart from there's a little a little ding in the side um, where something hard has hit, hit it hit it hit it um, slightly curious on this this has got a, a stuck on hand attached uh, gold number 004488 so although the model hasn't or the, the sticker on the inside hasn't got any identifying name um, this has been labelled by somebody. Maybe, maybe it's somebody's collection or some stock, and they put their own stock label on it. I'm just feeling the way these are coming out. <clears throat> There's a little bit of inconsistency. Some of them are tighter than others. Um, it's a bit. This one is a bit odd. That one was easy. Those are a bit tougher. This one's easy. So, hmm. uh, what I'll do. Do this one. Yeah, pretty chunky. One, two, three, four. So, like I said, this is a sort of a two-stage process, really. Um, a temporary or a, a, a now setup. And it's got two little sets of shims going on in there. Ooh, blimey. Wow. Hmm. Okay. I don't know how well you can see this. Is. <coughs> Sorry. Got quite a lot of shimming going on in the back here. So I want to... Since we're going <clears> to <throat> make some adjustments to everything, I don't want to leave it with sticky out bits of shim if we don't need it. Well, the first thing that's interesting is look how this uh, this neck heel doesn't uh, the sort of solid part solid part of the neck heel doesn't doesn't even come to the edge of the the uh, plastic. I suppose that that's, you don't need to if you're just putting this all in a in a plastic kind of container. So what we've got here is, this is a, an absolute minuscule paper shim, but here we've got some more substantial stuff going on. Um, where's my blade? Oh, where is my blade? Oh, typical, here it is. So, now this is a, this is quite a big shim, um, and that's obviously pushing the neck up to meet. By me, that is, that's a, not be at least, let's check out what it is, but it'd be at least a millimeter. <clears throat> Paper, paper and sandpaper, so uh, classic workshop guitar shim. But for interest, I'll check out what it comes out as thickness wise. One point seven mils. Now you take that out, and the neck goes down a, a shed load. So. <coughs> really, we have some we have some material we can take off there, but I don't want to go that far down. This shim at the front, this is so fine and so tiny, I really can't see a point in having this there. It's not going to make any difference that we can't correct with the um, the bridge itself. So a 1.81 mils. Um, this is going to need to remain. This shim, so they've kind of they've shimmed it and done it in such a way that it's kind of made a little ramp, but it doesn't really act like a ramp. It just kicks the back end up by that 1.8 mils. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if it was, if we took it out, all that would happen is the um, the neck would sit further away from the strings. We'd have to take far more off the bridge. 
to make it work out the way we want. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of leave it. Uh, I just kind of there's a bit of damage around these uh, these screw holes here. <coughs> but again, nothing nothing untoward or nothing too much nothing much to worry about. And while this is off, it makes sense to have a look at our take out our saddle. And first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to Oh, somebody's already marked it. So they've done, somebody's done quite a bit of work on this. They've got a base end marked on here. Okay. I haven't seen this before, have I? It's like I would have done it. Um, so we can get this back in here. Ooh. Okay. I'm just going to put these screws back. I think what would have splintered off those um, those pieces around the hole. Only drilling the holes really. That's about all that I can think of. Um. Right. I'm just looking at this. I don't. Yeah. The, the taking off that little piece of paper. Um, if there's a tiny difference in the action. All that will happen is that we can adjust for that on the, the adjustment on the saddle itself. So that pulls in nicely. A little bit more hard work, harder work. Uh, on the, the torque of five, which is a pretty good neck setting. You can feel that pulling in nicely. And there, and there. Okay. <coughs> now, let's just take that off. I'm going to put this out of the way for a second. Guitars everywhere. All safe? Good. Okay, so we've got our saddle here, and we've got the base end identified there. It's already got some very slight indentations which mark where the strings are, which is good. Now I want to take down. Um, I want to take down. Uh, what did I say? Let's write it up here. Minus minus 0.5 on the low E, but I don't know yet. I might really measure it actually. Uh, 0.5 and minus actually 0.5. Not 0.5 on both sides. So from 2 down to 1.5, but we'll just, I should have um, uh, jumped the gun a bit. Let's put this back in because I want to just recheck the action. It's always a little bit difficult, <clears throat> even with this undone fairly well. <coughs> That's all I took off. It's got something written on it, which I, I'll have a look at, see if it helps my detective work, find out where it came from. But yeah, this has been uh, Luthia touched before, so... Uh, right, that's been put on back to front. Uh, interesting. Or tied on, so it goes, it'll wind in any direction. Okay, this is this has made things a little bit harder. Um, with the neck off, I can get this back under here more easily. So as it happens, I'm just going to have to, I don't think I've got any more give on this uh, high E because it's wound on in such a way. Everything today has been non-standard, I have to tell you, it's been driving me with all kinds of problems. I haven't got through anything <coughs> easily. Base, front, back, base, front. Let's see if we can get you in there. Thank you. All right, for a minute, I'll do it back up and check the recheck the action with everything as is. Move over. This 
is the one that's crimped. <coughs> it looks like it'll break at any moment. Something like that, and then I'll just measure it again and see if, what difference, if any, that uh, paper shim made um, here. Okay, two point. Okay, I, that's just under two point five. Okay, so there's a tiny difference, just under two point five and two still so it's, <clears throat> it's just lifted up that bit so I'm going to I'm going to say minus 0 point, 0 0.3 on the base side and minus 0 0.5 on the top side so it's a very very small adjustment and to do that obviously I've got to get all these off again without digging these these spare bits of wire on here do a nice job digging into the lacquer, which is why I like to cut them right down <coughs> to nothing. Actually all of these strings have damaged, been damaged somewhere on the line, so they're, they're not really that fit for purpose. So the first thing I'm going to do, is I get this hopefully out again, first thing I'm going to do is to uh, shave down the saddle just a little bit and then once that's in I'm going to be testing it for all the strings to make sure everything that's each string plays all the notes we want it to play um, <clears throat> all right so and once we've done that then we do any fret leveling that's necessary um, but being very very careful with this because this guitar has its the life of its frets are fairly well used up. So this is a this is a very small bit of paper, but it used to read something. It's folded over. And it says travel insurance. Discover the best. Just call 0845 something or other. So that tells us <coughs> it's a it's a UK person who's shimmed this. <laughs> All right. So we have the base end here. And we want uh, 0.3 at the last fret, and we know that it, 0.3 off or off the um, saddle will translate into not 0.3 off the. How many fret? This one. So it's uh, it's halfway there. It's halfway again. So it's two thirds of the way. And that's 0.75 for those who like maths, not me. Um, <clears throat> so it's 1.75 time. Uh, if it's it's twice, if it's on the twelfth fret, it's twice. We'd need twice the adjustment. Um, two times. It's 1.7. It is 1.75 times the adjustment. So if I use my calculator on here, I can get in. That tells us. 1.75 times 0.3 equals 0.5 there and if we do 0.5 times 1.75 it tells us 0.8 on the <coughs> low E high E sorry so now I get my thing here and I measure set to zero if you will and then I measure a 0.5, which is an absolutely tiny amount, as you know. So we really aren't taking much off here at all. And we're taking the 0.5 off the base end of things. So 0.5 is almost uh, the width of a pen. Um, and ideally one that works, not this. So there's my 0.5, and then I want 0.8 off the top. 
off the treble. There we are. So it's going to be a line that goes a little bit further out at the treble side of things. And then, miraculously, I shall draw a line between the two of them. And it should be, as I see it with my human eyeballs, it should be kind of pushing out a little bit towards the treble side. And, of course, I've done it in a pen that's pretty much defunct. <clears throat> but, hell, I've done it. That really should go in the bin. Okay, well, there's my, there's my, my mark. There's my mark. Slightly more off the treble side and slightly less off the bass side. And here's how I do it. I was just talking about this last night, actually, to... Uh, some, uh, a friend and saying that I tend to do this by movement. I, I prefer to move me and not the piece. Uh, well, move the whole of me um, instead of instead of trying to uh, move the piece. Now this is I don't know what this is. Is it a, a kind of? Don't think it's bone. It's very hard plastic. I think it could be bone, but I'm not entirely sure. So I'm trying to first of all put some downward excess downward pressure on the treble side. I want, I want to kind of even this up first. So I'm getting there and then I can sort of relax a bit and square off and hopefully get the whole lot doing uh, at the same amount. And it's a matter of checking, checking for the square edge, the perpendicularness of it. Um, now this, remember, this is going to get chucked away at some point in the future when hopefully uh, Malcolm is able to dehumidify this, um, this guitar more than it currently is and with luck we should be able to replace this uh, well actually realistically we could probably shim it a couple of times and then replace it uh, with a higher one uh, as the bridge lowers, because as the bridge lowers, sorry, what am I talking about? As the bridge lowers, what am I talking about? Sorry, as the bridge lowers, the gap will increase. So, <laughs> bridge rises, bridge rises. As the bridge lowers, the gap will decrease. Sorry, what am I talking about? And therefore, we will have to um, reduce the bridge. And actually, with this one, we could probably take the shim out. So I think the bottom line is the shim is probably uh, countering the bellying of the bridge. That's why it's got this 1.8 millimeter shim. Um, the bridge has gone up, and so the owner or the tech has uh, shimmed the neck to bring the strings up. Sorry, bring the fingerboard up to meet the strings. But with luck, when we've dehumidified, that will change again for the, for the better. <coughs> okay, we're at the just about at the mark with the reduction, which I'm happy with. Okay, so um, we can just take that off. Oh, it's a little bit grubby, so I'm just going to do a tiny bit on the surface, see if we can make it look a little tidier. There you go. It's got rid of some of the grime that it had on it. So that's the fun and games with the saddle. For, the, for now, as I say, temporary setting really. Okay, so we have our low spot down there. and we'll push it in under here. And then press it in. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, this is where my Fantastic maths. Either my fantastic maths gets proved wrong, or uh, if my maths were correct, then chances are my filing might have gone wrong. Now this, I hate these. This great big piece of hanging over is getting right in the way, and it's all it's trying to do. This excess piece of uh, string, all it's trying to do is to dig into the lacquer of the, the uh, headstock. It's 
completely unnecessary, but every time you turn it with that bit sticking out, you will, <coughs> excuse me, you will uh, basically cut away the lacquer. Things all sit in the wrong place when you don't want them to. Thank you. And I will also cut this off. And this one over the top. job of this in the past. I like that. So we're down at the moment on just, I was cautious, but we're just over two mils on there. Maybe I stopped a little bit short actually. And just over two mils and we're just over, actually we're just we're still on about 0.2. So I could go a tiny fraction more. So let's just double check it. Um, first fret action. I think I'm going to leave it at that. Um, plus the fact if you dry it it's going to start coming down so they're going to leave a tiny little couple of months leeway in that I reckon. Um, the question is, Malcolm's got a bit of wear on these which uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to 
do too much to um, on this, given the, the fret heights aren't great. Let's have a look. Because I, what I'm doing, I'm kind of keeping an eye to the uh, 1.32. That's quite that's quite tall actually. 1.2. To not too bad really actually 1.5 oh bloody open the door don't you yeah it's not bad um yeah with this what's the options well if we if we go lower on this the minute it starts to dry out, it'll be hitting the hitting the deck because the bottom will go down. So I think we've got to build in a bit of playing while it dries out. So I think that's a decent enough action. Um, very low first fret. I don't want to do anything else with that. Um, there's barely any relief in here. So just a whiff of relief, tiniest amount, enough to play with. Um, but what I'm thinking about is the, the fret. their high spot. Well come on, <coughs> we haven't done this for a while, let's get this, let's just get this on the go. Um, I'll do one more, one more undo and what I'll do is we'll mark up the frets and we'll get this going. The nut slots, um, I haven't felt any sticking or anything so I don't think they need adjusting. They may already have been done in their time by the previous uh, luthier. Okay, so this, what we'll do now, we'll do the thing, we'll do the thing. I, I kind of half, half a mind to leave any fret levelling until later when, when it comes time to uh, either fix the bridge or um, reset the saddle because, uh, because, the, um, because the action will have gone down some. But uh, it does have a bit of wear here and uh, let's see if we can make it the best it can be. Normally, as I said before, I wouldn't want to get stuck into fret leveling just to remove that light wear on the first frets because it's not it's not interfering with play enough to really warrant it. That's my feeling. But I know how Malcolm likes his guitars, so we will give it the, the lightest of whispers. But the thing that sort of convinced me to do it is that that note up there on the high E. Um, that's what we don't need. See, that's, well, that's 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 the result of somebody stringing it with a with a knot tied around the thing, down around the post. That guarantees that it's going to break on me. <sighs> right, now to dig out a, a spare high E on the acoustics. This is a silk and steel one, but it'll have to do. I think I broke the what, the G broke on this set, so I've got a spare high E. But that's, yeah, that's that's what does it, I do find annoying about those um, that stringing method. Okay, here we have it. Which of these two? You, my little friend. Well, you, my little friend. Difficult to know. Uh, oh, blimey! Come on, which of you two? This one. I hope we can get there, but it's a different oh, it's a different kind of guitar, so we probably can't. <sighs> we can't get there. Holy crap. <sighs> it's uh, this this is an acoustic with a headstock 
shaped like a Gibson. Right, what that means, Malcolm, mm -hmm. is that we don't have uh, one of those strings. I'm going to have to use an electric top E for this, and we'll just make do, I'm afraid. It's not ideal, but... Otherwise, we're just going to end up parking this one as well. And I've got so many guitars now currently parked. That it's, it's annoying me a little bit. All right, spare top E of the electric variety. Bend the end of the string to make it poke upwards, and then it should come out through there easy enough. All right now, of course, on top of that, thanks to the the person who loves to string that particular fashion. I now have to dig out. What the hell was that? I now have to dig out this um, locked off piece and pull it through. Usually with a resultant stabbing. There you go, a little clip that I don't need knocking around. I tell I'm not a fan. Anyway. Right, let's see if I can get this all done up, ready to go again. Now this time I'm not really bothered about tuning precision, so I'm just bothered about getting it on there for tension purposes. Oh, yeah. That'll do. Please keep working. Thank you. about um, not stringing, not really wanting to string this with a, a plain G, is that the intonation on these um, compensated saddles it won't be correct for a plain G. The, the uh, compensation is, is for uh, a wound G usually. Anyway, okay look, so here we are back in the old tools that haven't been out for a while. I haven't been doing any of these for a bit, but I'm going to do the good old fashioned uh, fret leveling. So I need to mark up or divide up my fingerboard into three equidistant bits. Stick that middle, middle. Yep, that'll do. And I need a truss rod adjuster. Um, now what did I do with all my hex keys? Put them somewhere, didn't I? Tip them out and then forgot where they're there. Right. Here we go, that's my adjuster with a bit of junk on it. Don't need the amp on. Right, okay, let's get on with it. So the idea is to use the, these little devices to get my truss rod basically matched to the curve of the neck. This actually feels like it's it's on spot on because there's virtually no curve in the neck anyway, so it's kind of what we'd expect. So that's on. So the first thing I'm doing is dropping this off, spreading the strings apart down here, and I'm going to then gently use this under its own weight, really gravity, to level off the frets. And the first thing that will happen as I do it is it will tend to, well it will always, uh, 
cut up or sand down, whichever way you want to put it, sand down the high frets in the sequence. So it's cutting the first couple here, and it's cutting that one a little bit there, some there, none there, some there, some there, quite a bit there, quite a bit there, a little bit, none, 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 some, some, some. So in the whole series across the, or the whole setup of this neck, that's what's coming up as uneven. Now, the nice thing about this method is once I've done a bit of fret levelling, as long as I don't bust the string, I can gently lever that back in there and then test out all the notes. Still got a dead one there, and that's because this fret here is still in the way. And we can tell it's in the way because it's cutting more than the others, so um, all, all we know at this point in time is a little bit more to, to do on it. Um, now, if, you're, if your playing action was massively high, uh, you wouldn't have to worry about that. The, that. That high fret would be, if you like, safely underneath the playing action. That's what's good about this method. But because we've gone for a, a low playing action, um, that fret then becomes... Uh, it gets in the way, basically. Um, So what we've got is we've got a, probably got a low fret at eight. Uh, no, not at ten. No, nine. Sorry, nine. A low fret at nine, um, which is then causing it to the string to run into the frets here. Um, so we've got a little bit more to do. Now what I'll do, since I've worked on it a couple of shots already, I'm going to do what I usually do at this point and recalibrate it just to be sure it doesn't. Oops. It doesn't hurt to do that at all, it makes a lot of sense to do that. Okay, so it's now slackened off a little bit, which is entirely possible because I've handled it and in handling it I probably turn the turn the uh, the bar sorry turn the rod around a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna now do it one more or a couple more goes with that adjustment in it. Um, and it just makes sense to constantly recalibrate all the time. You can never never hurt to recalibrate it. And that's more likely now to this last go to take off that, that high spot around uh, around 12 which is which is kind of at the low fret at, at 9 is bringing into play. And that uh, kind of shows you something about frets generally and that is that the, the low action, the low, sorry, the low frets on the neck Brilliant. See that? Still, a, little bit, a tiny bit more, just to be absolutely spot on. It's very close. Um, yeah, it's the low frets on the neck that, that uh, the ones that dictate what goes on, really. Um, so in this case, there are some relatively high frets that this process takes down, but the buzzing that's going to interrupt play all comes about as a result of a low fret and you have to be able to judge whether you're going to get to that bottom of that low fret in such a way that plays okay like that or whether you're going to um, need it makes more sense to replace that one fret which is quite a big deal to do so I don't usually start um, by assuming that's what's going to need to be the case but what would happen is if I wasn't getting it to play right now, um, I would be now stopping and re-evaluating uh, that little cluster of frets and seeing whether in fact the real limitation is the low one. And if so, how low is it and is there any likelihood that we're going to um, kind of bottom it out and, and get the guitar to play the way we want? And if the answer is no, then at that sort of time I would make the decision whether it needs to be pulled allow the rest of the guitar to play. That's good. Now because I've moved over I'm going to recalibrate again as I head for the G track. Um, and you, can, you can do this A because the, the bar kind of changes a bit as you use it you know with sometimes like I said the 
the rod gets turned accidentally and it changes the, the curve slightly. But also because the neck, uh, the, the relief curve can actually change as you move across the neck. So towards this side it can be a little bit different. And so recalibrating is the way of ensuring that we, we sort of follow that um, any, any changes. Now as I'm doing this I'm concentrating on kind of working over the gap between the two the, the, the tracks on either side so kind of go right up to where the, the B track was and so on and I'm looking to see where it's cutting and looking to see where the very obviously low frets are. Um, I'm also uh, looking at the, the wear at this end here and I'm not I know you won't be able to see it, but right now on the B track on the uh, on the second on the first fret, the B track on the B string on the first fret, there's still a groove showing up as a little blob of dark marker pen. Um, but I've kind of passed it by. I've passed it by because it's the it's secondary really. It's not the primary concern. Um, and I don't want to chase lowering that, leveling that down just to get rid of a tiny groove um, that is a really gentle groove and actually isn't going to have any uh, consequence on the plane. So it's a kind of part of that is knowing, you know, in, as part of leveling these frets so that that one up there will play and everything else plays cleanly, a sort of secondary byproduct is that we're getting rid of some of the wear on the lower frets but not all of them and not all of it um, but as I said before if it was just about removing those light grooves um, they're not at a stage that get in the way of playing um, to make it worthwhile uh, to make it worthwhile carrying on uh, and costing you know fret metal on the rest of the guitar just to iron out cosmetic stuff now It'd be different if it got to a stage where those notches were, or those grooves were literally notches. That's just a vibration of some wires or something in there. It's not the, uh, it's not the frets. Um, that's one of the other things about this technique is you you have to become hello Morris you have to become proficient at hearing and interpreting what is fret rattle or fret buzz uh, from scratch. oh yikes Morris seriously everything you're Morris no 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 everything you're doing is going to be disaster just this second. Sorry fella. Um, I, can't, I can't have you do that. <laughs> Put this out of the way. Right, you can walk across that, right? That can, be a, that can be a little platform. That's what you did. You knocked that off, you devil. <sighs> yeah, um, what was I saying? I've forgotten now. Uh, he made me, he made me forget. Um, Something about, probably something about being able to guess or judge what you need to do and what you don't. Anyway, I've forgotten. It takes a while to get used to, that's, that's the, uh, the main thing. But uh, it's very rare that the wear down here is so bad that it actually gets in the way of. Um, playing such that you would sacrifice a lot of fret life in order to tidy it up. Um, occasionally it can be, sometimes the guitar can be so visibly warm that you want to get rid of it. But I tend to try and treat it as cosmetic, you know, so that if we do clear it up it's it's in pursuit of something more important like a low action and no frets. And it reminds me of what I was saying. The uh, Uh, what I was saying was that the you, you need to get you need to get um, you, you can build up experience of what is fret buzz caused by uneven frets uh, and fret slap 
which is caused by the strings not having enough room to rotate freely and, and hitting the frets at certain places. And um, <coughs> sometimes people kind of uh, mis mistake that for fret buzz. Um, and in fact, it's, it's not. Okay, right, done. That is done. Now we go on the next part of the process, which is the um, the reprofiling, which is quite fun to do and relatively easy. Um, followed by the polishing out, which is laborious and time consuming, but I tend to uh, switch the camera off and just go into radio listening mode, which I'll do here. So at this point, I'm going to lose these springs. These, oh, I think. I think I'll take this back over to um, Malcolm tomorrow because I'm seeing him tomorrow we're having a jam tomorrow night. So I'll take it over with these other strings if they even if they even work. Um, they may be just so awful that it's, uh, it's not even worth keeping them on there. They look they look like uh, Toman strings. No offense, Toman, but they're not, they're not at all confidence inspiring. Um, um, but if uh, and if, if it just really is horrible, then I think uh, we should get some decent ones in. I don't have any spare acoustic strings at the moment. They're all in use. Um, but yeah, this this deserves a decent set of strings on it. But like I said, this is going to be consider this. What's going to be permanent on this is the. Um, so better keep these, these will do as a set of acoustics for another time. Um, acoustic sacrificial strings is what I mean. Um, yeah, th this, is a, this is an interim or, or short-term setup really because of that. Hopefully, I, I gave um, Malcolm some desiccant pack yesterday, which should lower the uh, flatten the top on this guitar if he uses it over time in which case the action will change um, and within a few months it could become uh, too low in which case we will have to, um, have to reduce the saddle a bit more um, but you know that will eventually the point is that, that as you as the uh, Dehydration, so dehumidification, as it changes, gradually changes the or reduces the action because the top is going flat again. Um, what we can, we, we have the luxury of continuing to lower this saddle, uh, but eventually you reach a point where you don't want to lower it any further because you lose, you lose the desired or the ideal brake angle over the saddle. Um, which the strings need to impart enough energy into the top of the soundboard or whatever you call it, um, and, and which we, you know, when we get there, then if you, uh, if you basically at that point when this has dried out and we don't want to take this down any further, then what we'll do is we'll take the shim out of there. But the good thing is, is that the fret leveling done now um, won't change. It, with, it, with um, in regard to what the the top is doing in terms of its humidity content, so sorry, I'm looking for my marker pen, which has disappeared again. That's right. Is that what fell off? Maybe. Um, yeah. So so leveling the frets now is the sort of all time job. So however we get to uh, this low action or relatively low action again. Um, you know, with whatever's happening with that, the, the frets will still be um, nicely levelled in relation to each other when strung and under load, and that's what that method is really good for. So it's a kind of a, it's good, it, 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 it works. It's, it's independent of what the action is doing, although we set the action in order to, to uh, do it, but that's kind of more so that we can see whether what we're doing with the frets is efficient or not. Okay, so I'm just going to crown these frets now, do my best to make them 
um, rounded at the top instead of flattened, which they currently have a bit of a flat spot on them. So this very nice Stumac fret crowning tool. Um, I'm using a medium uh, gauge at the moment, a medium fret profile, so it's not, not jumbo, but just medium. And then kind of just using it to iron or smooth off the edges or the shoulders of the frets so that they're a bit more arch shaped. And then we're going to polish them all out with various grades of sandpaper, off camera hopefully. Um, and then once that's done, we're, uh, we'll put those funny strings on and uh, hopefully Malcolm will uh, have some fun with it tomorrow. But, um, while, the, while the strings are off, note to self, I must go looking for where the battery is in here because um, since he's got it the other day, uh, Malcolm hasn't had a chance to find the battery or explore. And there's not a lot of room in there, so um, it'll be, we'll, have, we'll have a quick look with a, with a light and a camera, even if I can't see it, the camera will see it. And then you can tell me what you saw. Yeah, this is uh, interesting to see if we can find this online, whatever the model is. Um, I say I've not seen it personally. It's a little bit like the Fender has a has a guitar like this, a similar style. Okay, so that's my that's my um, re-profiling done. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a look at these. Um, what I might do, I'm going to do a couple of things off camera here, but, ooh, hang on, it's got a, something written on it. Ah, it's got a postcode in invisible ink. Aha! Malcolm, you didn't steal this, did you? I can trace this now. <laughs> ooh, don't tell anyone. Uh, yeah, okay. I hope it didn't have a checkered history. There's no reason why it should. So just because somebody's put a, um, some invisible ink identifier on it doesn't mean uh, it has automatically been thiefed. Okay. Um, right. What I, what I was going to do while I'm at it is I'm going to take the truss rod cover off and I'm going to take the tuners off just so I can give the headstock a good clean. Part of what I like to do it doesn't take me much longer when the camera's off and I'm just listening to the radio. Then it's just brain off time and so I can get that bit done um, but it if you're giving a spruce up to a guitar uh, then taking the tuners off is a really quick and win-win sort of way of uh, getting a bit Morris don't lick those um, a bit of a, a quick a quick way win-win way of getting some cleanup done because when the tuners are on you literally will never be able to clean around them adequately. So the headstock will always look a little bit old. So um, what I'm doing here is just, Morris, would you, psh, psh, psh. Morris, no, you can't eat those. They're not for you. They're my, they're my, these are my rhubarb and lemon sweets. No, whatever, rhubarb and custard sweets that I got from town. They're mine. Hello, Morris. People haven't seen you for ages. Come here, Morris, Morris. Morris, psst, psst. Morris, come here, come on, come here and be friendly. I know it's not a lot of room for you to walk, is there? There we go. He's got some really, really sticky, great clots of hair under here on this side. I don't know if you can see it. There we go. And I've been catching him with the scissors every now and then and having a little gentle snip, but I have to be very careful where his his personage begins and his fur ends. Isn't that right? Okay, Mister. And um, so it's uh, it's very very small small steps, little steps. You can't have my sweets. You don't like sweets. You better not have. You better not have licked that one. Anyway, yeah. So he's uh, you can tell he's a he's a sort of fluffy thing at the best of times, but it does. And here he gets into um, dreadlocks now and then. And we can't really do much other than chop it. Okay, 
Right, so um, I'm going to go off camera. What I'm going to do is clean the headstock, um, clean everything else a little bit, um, and then I'm going to tape up the fingerboard and polish out with a load of different grade sandpapers. And then um, I'll come back when it's restrung or when I'm restringing it with these weird strings and we'll see how we go from there. All right, see you in a minute. Right, here we go. Fret leveling, polishing done. So it remains to give it a little clean, restring or a clean bit of oil, and then restring, and we go from there. But recommending some better quality strings than this particular set. And then that'll be me done for this evening. Um, some songs to learn, well, refresh on for tomorrow's jam session. And I've got two gigs at the end of this month locally. So, and one of them, my eldest son, is going to be able to come down. So I don't know whether to be proud or afraid or... It was a... Uh, I'm not quite sure how it was last time, uh, a week or so ago. Actually, a week ago, yesterday. Um, well, although I can be very critical of how we played, or how I played, um, we played a three quarter of an hour set and then had a break for half an hour and then did a second set where we were sort of on chord and on chord and on chord and played two hours solid in the second set. So I guess a small, a small but appreciative audience um, seemed to enjoy it. So that's all that matters really, isn't it? So on that level, it was uh, it was successful. Although I thought it was uh, I got a lot to learn. I don't know the songs, some of the songs particularly well. But you know, sometimes you can get obsessed with that and then forget that actually the audience is having a good time. Or it's only when you see the audience having a good time that it can sometimes remind you to forget your self-criticism or your extreme critical judgments of your own abilities and so on <sighs> anyway but yeah so there's a couple more coming up in two or three weeks time <coughs> it'll be after my wife's had her operation so, so fingers crossed that that's going to go all right okay so a little bit of very small amount of oil or the fingerboard and sometimes this last bit of the process helps to um, lift off any edges of glue glue pen still on the frets sometimes on the sides of the frets there's a little bit of leftover glue and then this also helps to clean off any um, original finger grease some of which should have come off in the, and I cleaned it up a little bit earlier, but... Right, there's that. And then I'll just take off the excess. Make sure it's just not sitting on the surface. Okay. Right, then there we are. Ringers, six. Can't even cut that with my teeth. Ooh. Ooh. Right. Uh, whew, these are barely even reached. That's that's why I realise it now. That's why the string was tied. Because the regular acoustic string 
doesn't reach all the way to that last fret with enough clearance for it to hold tight. And uh, where did I experience that? I did that the other day with the guitar. Uh, I think it was actually, I think it was the arch top. I'm not quite sure why, but something. Anyway, just the other day I had that same thing and I realized it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't, there wasn't enough string. So it was always going to slip. So they've, they've tied, they've counted that by tying it, which um, sounds stupid, but I actually don't know how to do. I haven't really done it before, so I can't, I can't imagine how I'd tie a knot in a string at that end. It's not really exactly rocket science, but it feels a bit like it. Anyway, these are horrible. There must be a set of, there must be a brand make of string somewhere that uh, runs to fits acoustic strings that fit a six in the line headstock um, can't all be too short that would be a bit of a disaster some of these strings feel look and feel grim sorry Malcolm Anyway, we'll have to do just for now. These feel like Chinese, well, I guess a lot of them are Chinese, but it feels like a Chinese Ali, AliExpress special. about well, the last tomorrow night's session I hope um, but who knows I got uh, silk and steel in my acoustic the other day in fact then I broke a string and bought some silk and phosphor kind of by accident I really like the silk and steel so I was going to buy them again um, but I mis made a mistake and bought silk and phosphor only noticing the silk bit, I think, and uh, they're not not as nice as the silk and steels. But the uh, silk and steels are not as well, they feel less strong than um, regular guitar strings, uh, acoustic strings. However, I do like the way they sound, and, uh, and particularly the way they feel. So they are definitely be getting them again. But I, I made the mistake of uh, stretching them a bit too hard and they broke because they're not as strong as electric guitar strings. The G string broke. So that was that set gone. Oh, these are all, these are a mismatch of things. Malcolm, you shouldn't have. But I guess it will do for now. They're really. Ooh, <laughs> look at this coiled up horror. I've been listening the last day or so of the various news reports of. Um, <laughs> Donald Trump's master stroke of diplomacy, quote unquote, in getting a meeting with Kim Jong Un. And uh, it's just it's so funny, you know, that insane puppet nutcase has played and played, well, not how it played, but has played a game brinkmanship with. Donald Trump and the two of them are probably fully aware that both of them are going to benefit massively from it. In other words, Trump's going to make out that he's uh, oh, that does fit. Trump's going to make out that he's uh, he's a fantastic statesman. Blah blah blah, and uh, Kim will get his sanctions rescinded for some crap 
lie of a deal or promise that he's not going to either either um, never had any nuclear capability at all and he'll agree to disband it or something uh, in exchange for lessening of sanctions and uh, he'll get a massive boost in power and wealth, personal wealth. Well, Donald Trump will get a second term for being the, you know, stopping nuclear war and averting the end of the world. And then the people of both sets of countries will pay for it. That's about it, really. It's a, it's a pretty depressing um, outcome. Oh, these strings feel horrible. I'm not going to attempt to do any major bending here because I don't trust these strings at all. I'm just going to pretty much do it up to pitch. And then um, leave it overnight. hear the very end bit um, which is called finishing it off and uh, job done and time to go in but yeah removed, um, bridge uh, saddle very slightly lowered, bridge bellying, uh, sorry, top bellying assessed, um, dehumidification uh, recommended, saddle slightly lowered, frets leveled, headstock cleaned, nut checked but the first fret action is very good and frets reprofiled, polished out, um, fingerboard oiled and restrung with grotty strings but, oh, little thing to do up there, um, in all of that, battery, 9 volt battery found just inside of there, so uh, all is well. It has, been, it has been located, and I will point out where it is to Malcolm in due course. Now, I have a feeling that this might require uh, some... No, actually it's really good. Good and solid. It's good and solid. Right, we're done. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching, and Tanglewood Company, uh, unnamed brand of or unnamed model but I'll take that back in along with the fender and uh, tomorrow we'll unclamp that arch top and see where we go from there thanks for watching